I have 1030, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining this morning's Beef Brunch Educational Series webinar. Uh, my name is Ashley Edwards, and I'm a livestock agent for the LSU Ag Center. Our speaker today is Dr. Guillermo Scaglia, who's a professor and beef cattle nutritionist with the Ag Center. Um, he's going to be discussing how to plan for grazing your winter annual pastures. We were just visiting before we started this webinar. I know a lot of people are planting right now. Um, I'm starting to plan forward on how you're going to utilize those, so it's a very timely topic. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. We are going to be muting your microphones and we ask that you keep them muted throughout the webinar. If you're joining us online through the Teams app or the link, you can place your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. If you're calling in and listening on your phone, uh, you can text questions to me. That number is 512-818-5476. Again, if you're calling in, you can text your questions throughout the webinar to 512-818-5476. In the interest of time, we are going to wait to answer any questions until the end of the presentation. With that, Dr. Scaglia, thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. You should be able to unmute your microphone and begin whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation uh, to give this, uh, this presentation. We are going to be talking about a little bit on uh, planning grazing of uh, winter animals. Um, just just a few uh, concepts uh, that I would like to remind all of you um, before getting into the presentation itself. The first one is just a, a small description of the anatomy of, uh, of the grass. Um, as you can see from top to bottom, you have the inflorescence or, or flower. Um, then you have the flag leaf. Uh, then you have the uh, internodes, nodes. And at the bottom of the, of the plant, close to the to the ground, um, you had what we call the uh, growing points. Um, if you uh, take a look at this uh, portion of the of the slide um, over here to the right, you see how it looks. And basically, the the point that I'm trying to make on this is that uh, here is where basically you can find the meristemic tissue where all the leaves uh, and the stems are going to uh, develop from. Uh, you have uh, the blade, uh, which is part of the of the leaf, as you know, the sheath and the development leaf uh, below. Then you have emerging tillers that are coming up also from there. And at the bottom, you have all the tiller buds. That means that from here, uh, new tillers are going to be developed in that uh, in that plant. Um, this uh, specific uh, region of the plant, uh, the growing points are important from the standpoint of survival of the plant. Um, during grazing, you don't want cattle to actually eat this portion of the plant because uh, that can cause the death of the plant or uh, the recovery um, of it is going to be very, very slow. Um, as part of the, of the leaves, you have the blade um, on top of it, and then you have what we call the sheath that basically is, a, uh, you know, it's part of the, of the structure of the leaf that um, surrounds the stem. Also important to note are the what we call before the internodes, um, because the the whenever the, the plants start growing and is reaching uh, the reproductive stage, these internodes are going to grow as we're going to uh, show in a minute, which means that the growing points are going to also be a, uh, on a on a uh, greater height, which makes them even more vulnerable for uh, for grazing. Tillers are a are very important uh, from the standpoint of forage production and and, and plant forage mass. Um, those those tillers are are basically the branch of a of a grass plant. Uh, as the tiller growth and develop, it actually can can produce more even more tillers or additional tillers in the leaf axils of uh, of that particular tiller that already grow. Uh, the roots are, of course, uh, very important, and uh, we have roots associated with each of these uh, tillers. The crown is actually the point of the plant where uh, the shoot system or the tillers meet uh, with, uh, with roots. We're going to be discussing a little bit more of this uh, issue about our tillering of the plant, but basically what it is is the more branches that we can produce in a plant, the more dry matter is going to be produced. How the grass developed. Uh, once we, we plant uh, the seed and it's incorporated into the ground a few days later, 
uh, the primary root will, will come up. Uh, that's what we call germination. After a few days, the first leaf will appear um, on, the, on the ground and a few other uh, roots are also developed. Uh, the first leaf will continue to grow and adventitious roots are going to form, which basically are the secondary root uh, systems too. And then we have the two leaf uh, stage. After it, the three leaf stage. And after that is when we are going to start seeing what we call the development of the, of the tillers. The initial, the initial uh, tillering, as you can see from uh, this uh, drawing uh, to your right, the plant seems to have a lot more leaves, meaning that is, the, the more tillers are produced, more forage is produced. Why the tillering uh, stage is important? Because this is the ideal time to actually start grazing. We need to wait until this point in order to, to start grazing. That will make sure that we have enough uh, leaf area for actually the animal, the animal graze, and we are going to stimulate even more tillering by, by removing the, 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 the leaves uh, that are produced. But also, it's, uh, it, we need to wait until the plant is well developed so that we can have what we call the crown roots. Uh, those, those crown roots are critical in order for, for, the, for the plant to anchor to the soil and will make a lot more um, uh, able to withstand grazing. So both things, enough tillering and enough development of the crown roots are critical for the moment to start uh, grazing. Uh, annual ryegrass, which we, we are gonna base the, the presentation most on, on it, uh, have a very long roots, can actually can create channels up to three to five feet um, into the soil profile. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very important uh, characteristic of, uh, of ryegrass from the standpoint of making the soil um, uh, much more um, uh, suitable for, for crops that may come after um, that, uh, that ryegrass. After the, the initial phases, we have what we call the transition phase. At that point, the shoot will, will start elongating uh, and the leaf and sheets and internodes will elongate. That means that many stomatic tissue, the, the growing points that were close to the ground, are actually going to be uh, raising in height. And that, that will make it a lot more uh, risky uh, to graze and actually uh, eliminate those growing points. If we do that, um, we may kill the plant or the recovery will be very slow because it will depend basically on the uh, leaf area that, we'll, that we will leave after, after grazing. So, Taking into consideration that point is critical for um, the correct uh, grazing management. The next phase is the re reproductive phase, and basically what it refers is the production of, uh, of the seed head. But before that, we have the, the appearance of what we call the flag leaf, which technically will be the last leaf produced. Um, the seed head is, uh, it, it, uh, it starts to appear at the early boot stage. Uh, you can see that boot stage here um, that is already uh, being formed. The forage nutrient value of, uh, of an, specifically annual ryegrass is very, is very good until um, this boot stage. After it, the quality decreases really, really quickly. And, uh, and you need to take that into consideration because it may not cover requirements for, for cattle that are actually grazing. Uh, then we have, of course, uh, seed head emergence, et cetera. Um, if this uh, this uh, seed head emergence doesn't mean that you don't do, you don't need to graze. It's just that, uh, for for example, if you want to have uh, your or your forages uh, reseeding, um, you need to take animals out so you allow for the seed to be produced um, in the in the plants. Um, but again, if you if you graze uh, during this uh, this phase, uh, quality goes down really quickly. Just to uh, make a little bit more emphasis on this uh, particular issue, when uh, forages are immature, they are leafy, um, the leaf to stem ratio is high, usually it's high protein, high digestibility, high concentration of minerals. That's what happens uh, when we have a lot of leaves on the plant uh, during the vegetative stage. As the, grow, uh, the growth of that plant uh, happens, uh, maturity, uh, of course, increases, which means that the uh, leaf stem ratio is going to decrease, protein concentration decrease, digestibility also decrease, fiber go will go up, um, and so the quality at that point will be much lower than at the beginning of the growing stage. 
This graph here uh, shows uh, what what it looks like um, if we look, if we let annual ryegrass or small grains grow. Uh, that's that's the way it looks from the standpoint of forage accumulation. This is what we call a biphasic um, uh, growth curve with a with a peak of production in the fall, which is relatively uh, small. Then the growth rate during the winter is uh, is low. It happens, but it's very it's very low. And then in the spring, uh, the rate of growth is is uh, is quite quite high. Um, so the issue with this is how we graze pastures that are not growing continuously, right? Uh, we have, as again, we have that peak in the fall, but then it goes down uh, really, um, really, um, really low in the during the uh, winter month, and then goes up again, as I said, uh, during the spring. So when should you start grazing? And there is many, many questions that you probably need to answer before before uh, that one. Uh, and some factors that you need to consider. So, um, when did you plant? Um, you know, I don't know if you, what, what's your, in your, your case, but um, I actually have been able to start planting at uh, the Iberia Research Station, at Dean Lee Research Station this week. Uh, we haven't been able to do it before just because it was uh, too wet. We had a lot of rain during, during September. Um, and uh, an early an early October October and it and it is uh, it, it became uh, dry enough uh, during this past weekend and and so we started Monday. So um, in the past we have been able to start planting late September, but also we have had years that we went into late October uh, because it it was uh, it was too wet to do it before. So weather conditions evidently are important. Rain before, during, and after planting um, are of course uh, important, as well as temperature. We can have a cold or a warm uh, fall that may affect, as we will see, uh, the growth rate of, uh, of winter winter pastures. How did you plant? Meaning, what what was the planting system you used? Conventional, no-till, or preceded? Uh, usually, that's the order where you can get into the pasture uh, from earlier to later. Conventional will give you grass earlier um, in the in the grazing season, no till somewhere in the middle, and overseeded pastures uh, will be the the latest uh, that we can get in uh, with cattle. When you planted, was there summer grass competition, meaning bahia grass or Bermuda grass? Or, um, what was the the summer grass residue at the time of um, at the time of planting, uh, this can can have a great effect on on how easy how uh, the summer I mean sorry the for the forages the uh, winter annuals uh, can grow because of competition for light and also water. If you plant it on clean pasture, probably you're going to be more successful uh, with a very little competition from any uh, from any other uh, forage. The grazing strategy that you're going to use will also affect how the plant react to that grazing to that grazing strategy. Uh, stocking rate is probably the most important variable that you need to uh, make sure that you set right. Uh, we are going to talk about a little bit more about this uh, this particular issue um, later on. Uh, and probably one of my advi biggest advice in, the, in this presentation will be to forget about the calendar date. Uh, what it means is. Uh, I know a lot of people that say, oh, by Thanksgiving, I'm going to put cattle into the pasture, and they, they are talking two months in advance. And uh, you don't know, actually, if you're going to be able to do that. Wait until the time is right to actually start grazing your pastures. So I'm going to try to show that what I mean uh, later on the, on the presentation. Um, as, as I said before, weather, rain, temperatures affect um, how well uh, grasses can grow. And the blue line are the cool the cool season grasses as you can see uh, and this is the graph of relative relative growth uh, versus temperature as you can see the maximum relative growth for cool season grasses is when temperature is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit all right um, so that's why that explain why during the uh, winter uh, the growth is is really slow we know that below uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit uh, all processes or physiological processes in cool season grasses <clears throat> actually start to the, to decline significantly. So this in part explain uh, why uh, cool season grasses grow very little during during winter. Now it's evidently important to know uh, how much forage we have in the pasture in order to make the decision as to how to graze, when to graze, and with what to graze. Um, there are 
there are many different ways to estimate uh, dry matter in a, in a pasture <clears throat> from sampling sampling the grass uh, dried with a microwave oven and and that gives you an idea of um, of dry matter. We talk about this uh, this issue and this technique on the in the advanced master cattleman program. Um, but one rule of thumb that we have is is what what this slide is is presenting is basically uh, this table. Don't take it like it is um, you know uh, uh, like follow uh, uh, point by point. Just this is a reference for you uh, in order to kind of estimate how much grass you have there. What basically this is you have the different forage species, and then you have uh, dry matter pounds per acre per inch on average for for each of these. Uh, for each species. So let's talk about annual ryegrass for a minute. As you can see, annual ryegrass it says that you have approximately, you should have approximately 250 uh, pounds of dry matter per acre uh, per inch of, uh, of plants. So if you have the forage height um, and trying to decide when you start grazing, you know that if for every inch of that height that you measure, you have approximately 250 pounds of dry matter. The problem with that is the column on the right, and that's the range that can be possible from 75 pounds to 400 pounds per acre per inch. So the range is huge. I mean, the average is 250, but the range can be can be really really big. So this this that's why I'm saying use this table as a guideline or, or rule of thumb type of thing. But it doesn't mean that it's gonna actually indicate the, the real uh, yield of those pastures based on, on height. It's for you uh, to have an idea. Again, you have all these different forage species, not just um, annual ryegrass. And why it's important to know how much forage is available in the pasture? Because uh, less, less or, or a small amount of forage available can restrict uh, dry matter intake. And that's the one thing that you don't want uh, to have in your, in your cattle. You want animals to actually consume as much as as much as possible and as long as their their potential for intake uh, can endure. And why this is important, just uh, this graph shows that for um, for cattle that are with a relative intake of 100 percent, you need at least 2,000 pounds of dry matter per acre. With 1,000 pounds uh, uh, of dry matter per acre, uh, that animal will consume just around 75% of the potential intake. What th this means that in a 1,200 pound uh, that can actually eat 2.5% body weight, if she has 2,000 pounds of dry matter available, she will be able to consume 30 pounds, but only 19 if the availability of that forage uh, is 1,000 pounds. So this is a change in nearly 50% uh, of, uh, of intake of amount or pounds of dry matter intake. So having forage available out there, uh, enough for our cattle to consume as much as they can is a very important issue. Pastures don't look the same every year, don't look the same uh, within season, don't look the same across the fence. So um, just uh, we always need to make sure that uh, that we have a, 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 a the best pasture possible and uh, for that we need, we need to control as many factors as possible during uh, preparation of the of the ground, uh, planting planting date, planting depth, uh, decision on how we are going to fertilize, grazing management, etc. As I said, one of the most important variables to determine is uh, is uh, stocking rate, and this is relative stocking rate, low, uh, I'm sorry, low or or high, and basically, and I know you have seen this graph many times. But basically, what it what it indicates is if you use a low stocking rate, more than probably you're going to be under grazing uh, your pastures. Your you will be able to get your animals to gain as much as their pot genetic potential allow them to gain. But the gain, but the gain per per unit of land is gonna is gonna be kind of low. On the other side of the graph is the if the stocking rate that you use is too high, that means that both gain per land um, uh, area as well as gain per animal are gonna be uh, lower. And you, of course, you're gonna be overgrazing your pastures with all the negative impacts that that uh, may have. So there is usually an optimum range of stocking rates where you can you can work, where probably you will not maximize your, your gain per animal, but you're gonna be close to, the, to maximize gain per land uh, per area. 
And this, the problem is that this target or this optimum range uh, varies. And from year to year may vary just because of all the conditions that affect uh, forage, forage production. So keep that in mind. I showed you before this uh, this graph, just basically explaining how uh, how grasses grow, uh, this, the winter annuals um, grasses grow. So comes the decision of when to begin grazing. And if you want to look, I left the, the, the dates here on purpose, but it just, uh, if you want to decide how to grow, how to, or when to start grazing, uh, you can start November 15, let's say, as I'm giving examples, December 15 and January 15. If you start November 15, and if the growth curve is actually this one for that particular year, you're gonna start grazing before the peak of production of that particular pasture, which means that you're not gonna let that plant or those plants in, the, in, in your pasture uh, produce as much as they, they can during that period of time. If you start on, on, December, on December 15, uh, you actually are after the peak of, of production. There are, should be more forage accumulated at this, at this date than on November 15, of course. Uh, so that, that means that you can probably go, or may or may or may not, but you may be going through the winter without any, any need to change uh, a stocking rate. If you start January 15, that means that you are already past all that period of, of growth. You are uh, at the beginning or, or mid um, winter uh, when there is a drop in the, in the growth rate, but after that, you know that growth will, um, will start to go, up, to go up. So let's assume for just for the sake of uh, the discussion that we start grazing on December, December 15. Now comes the decision as to what stocking rate to use. And I'm using relative stocking rate because I don't want to give uh, any, any, any advice in terms of what to use until uh, in a few minutes I will get there. But here we have, let's say that we use uh, a low stocking rate. A low stocking rate, what will allow you to do is to use all that forest that was accumulated until now, until then, and probably after December 15, when growth rates are, are kind of low, that low stocking rate may allow you to go through the whole winter without the need to, to switch any, any, any plants, and meaning you're gonna keep that same stocking rate until that moment. The problem with using a low stocking rate then, or after February 15, is that this growth rate is going to be much more uh, important than what actually the animals can, can consume. So the efficiency of harvesting or the efficiency of consuming this, uh, this peak of production is going to be kind of low. If you use a medium stocking rate and you set your stocking rate at that point on December 15, you may be using a little bit more all this forage accumulated until then and you, but you may get into trouble, uh, and again, it will depend on the year, but you may get into trouble because of the low growth rate at this point in time. Maybe we'll let you go through the whole winter without any changes, but again, I'm saying maybe already like two or three times. Um, once you get into the spring, again, this medium stocking rate may not be enough to actually efficient, efficiently uh, consume uh, all this forage that is produced uh, during this month. Then you have a high stocking rate. Well, the issue with a high stocking rate at the beginning of the grazing season is that you're actually gonna run out of this, this, all this forage that was accumulated really quickly. Uh, and if you do that, it's gonna be too short to actually allow, to, allow them to graze uh, normally. So more than probably, you're gonna need to take animals out of the pasture just because there is not gonna be enough forage out there um, to consume. On the other hand, the good thing about the high stocking rate in the spring is that you can actually be able to harvest uh, all the forest that is, uh, that is produced at that point. Again, these are relative stocking rates. Uh, just to give you an idea of how I think uh, you need to go through the, the decision uh, process as to what uh, stocking rate to use. A few years back, we conducted a, an experiment dealing with uh, different stocking rates of uh, steers that were continuously stocked on annual ryegrass. Uh, this shows the average daily gains that we obtained uh, and the forage allowance uh, in pounds of dry matter uh, of, of ryegrass per pound of body weight of those steers. Um, what on the, here on the, on the right, you have the stocking rates that, that uh, we used. And again, I don't want to use 
animals per acre. I want to make sure you, you use or you start thinking about using pounds of body weight per acre. And the reason for that is, is very simple. If I say two steers per acre, um, if your steers are 400 pounds and your neighbor's steers are 600 pounds, well, that's, that's a lot of difference in pounds, in, in pounds of body weight per acre. Uh, they are the same number, two heads, but the pounds per acre is quite different. So we need to start thinking about stocking rate in terms of pounds of body weight uh, per, unit of, per unit of land. So the low stocking rate that we used was 755 uh, pounds, and the high stocking rate we used was uh, 1,215 pounds to the acre. So in terms of, if you, again, if you want to do the math, if, I, if we are talking about um, um, 400 pound steers, this is nearly two uh, steers to the acre, and here it's uh, three steers to the acre. So there is a, believe it or not, there is a substantial difference on, on what the response is uh, just with that little difference. But with what this graph is showing is that um, at low stocking rate, the circles are over there, uh, with a forage allowance around two pounds of dry matter per pound of body weight at the beginning of the grazing season. And remember, they were continuously stocked, so I put them in a pasture and they, I didn't take them out from there. They were able to gain uh, over 2.2 pounds uh, per day. On the other hand, the ones with a high stocking rate, which are down here, uh, they gain a little uh, around 1.1 um, pounds to, uh, per day. Uh, and the forage allowance was, of course, a lot less because we have more, um, more pounds to the acre uh, compared with the low stocking rate. And what happened with the use of these stocking rates on, on forage growth rate? Um, this is this is what happened. Uh, the only one, uh, the only stocking rate that allow actually for a kind of biphasic uh, growth of uh, curve was uh, the low stocking rate. The other ones, 910 pounds to the acre, 10, 1060 and 1215, all of them basically um, make up a, a, a huge decrease in the growth rate possible for those for those pasture. Um, here is uh, the sampling periods uh, from zero to, to seven. And what it is, is it's, uh, I, I sample the, we sample the, gra the forage every 15 days. So sampling period one is 15 days after we start grazing. Two will be 30 days, for, uh, 45 days, 60 days, um, 75 days. The reason I'm showing this is, as you can see, the high stocking rate. Uh, the last data point that, that we are showing is in sampling period four. That means that on, 60, on day 60, after we start grazing, um, those pastures, we needed to take the animals out because there was not enough forage. Uh, so that, that, that's also an effect that, that the stocking rate that you use have on your, on your grass. Evidently, sh shortening the, the grazing season is, not, is something that you uh, really don't want that to happen. Another way to deal with, uh, with the forage production and efficient use of the forage from the standpoint of the, of, uh, of the pasture is to use a variable stocking rate. And that I kind of mentioned that uh, uh, a few minutes ago. To start with a low uh, stocking rate, um, again, let's, see that, let's say that we start on December 15. Start with a low stocking rate so that we can consume that, that uh, grass that was produced during, during the fall, uh, that we don't have or we don't cause any negative effects during the, during the winter, not for the animal, not for the pasture. But then when it's time um, in March or somewhere there, uh, increase the, the stocking rate in, in the pasture, meaning you put more, more animals into that, that pasture so they can use uh, efficiently that, uh, that, um, that, uh, that increase in, the, in forage produced. From the standpoint of the forage, that's probably the most efficient use of it. Start with a, with a low stocking rate. And again, I'm saying low, but it's, it's, uh, it's, a, rel it's a relative uh, term. Start with a low uh, stocking rate and then increase uh, the stocking rate in the pasture whenever it's time uh, for to, to consume that extra forage that is produced uh, during the spring. Uh, many producers um, have, have used uh, annual ryegrass or, or want to use annual ryegrass kind of a, uh, on a limit grazing plan, meaning giving animals just uh, a, few, um, a few hours per day uh, to consume ryegrass while the rest of the time 
uh, they are consuming hay. That's that's uh, that's not a bad idea from the standpoint of using the ryegrass as a supplement, basically, um, as we're going to see in a minute. So assuming that we have a, that we have a 1,200 pound animals, um, depending on the physiological stage, mid pregnancy, late pregnancy, or um, or early lactation, uh, requirements are going to be are going to be different. Uh, they can consume uh, different too. They have uh, more energy requirements as we advance in the pregnancy or after calving, and the same with uh, with crude protein. So, assuming that our annual ryegrass had a 2,000 pounds of rye matter to the acre with values of crude protein, these are normal values actually, 18% and 70% and TDM. One point that I want to make is if you have at that appropriate uh, stocking rate. Um, or appropriate forage allowance for those animals, and you have all uh, you have the cows on uh, on ryegrass 100% of the time. Uh, it will it will cover the requirements for energy and protein. So, saying that, let's say that <clears throat> we have, as I mentioned before, um, the basal diet is hay, uh, Bermuda grass hay. We used uh, with a with an energy of uh, 50 or well, TDN of 50 54% and crude protein content of uh, 9%. We allow them to uh, graze for three hours on, uh, on ryegrass on a daily basis. And basically what I'm, what I'm indicating in this table is that annual ryegrass was, um, was plus, um, annual ryegrass, I'm sorry, annual ryegrass with a three hour uh, grazing period per day covered the requirements of protein for animals that are in the mid gestation and late gestation. But the um, the numbers in with uh, on on orange, uh, those values are not covered by the by the uh, by the annual ryegrass. However, uh, this hay will help cover the rest of the TDN and crude protein requirements. What I'm saying with this is, just the three-hour ryegrass cover the protein requirements for uh, mid gestation and late gestation uh, in pregnant cows. If we, if we let them graze for five hours. That, that five hours of ryegrass allow to cover the requirements of protein for all three um, physiological, in all three physiological stages and the energy requirements for mid, uh, mid gestation. Uh, we are still on the, on the orange side on, on energy for late pregnancy and early lactation, but again, that hay also will cover the, the needed, uh, the remaining pounds of TDM needed in both physiological stages. So, uh, using limit grazing for uh, supplementation of cows is actually a, um, a pretty good uh, way to use uh, that, that grass. Now, in terms of the daily cost, and this, this is first of all to say, uh, standing forages are, are, are always the cheapest uh, source of nutrients. So the more you can use standing forages, the best you're going to be. Bales or, or hay is, is, not, is not cheap uh, to produce. And once you put all the numbers uh, together, um, we came up uh, with, this, with this in particular. Again, the cheapest for any of the cows in any of the physiological stages will be to have them on 100% on ryegrass. As we add uh, hours of ryegrass, or we have, as I said, uh, hay as basal dye, the cost will go up. And um, and of course, it will, the most expensive one will be the one using the least uh, ryegrass. Uh, again, with five hours of ryegrass, uh, we are somewhere in the middle in, the terms, in terms of cost uh, between three hours of ryegrass uh, per day or 100% of the time on ryegrass. Now, keep into consideration that these costs are without adding labor or losses due to, to feeding hay. So, Again, um, as, and again, as we are going to see in a minute, in terms of height uh, to start grazing and height to, to get out of the pasture, um, and assuming that we have 250 pounds uh, dry matter uh, per inch, uh, we basically need uh, we we are be able will be able to use around one and a, one and a half cow per acre with three or to five hours of uh, of daily grazing. So. Um, we need to we need to think about that. That again uh, is a rule of thumb um, in terms of how much dry matter per inch that animal ryegrass may have, as well as uh, how many cows per acre we can have. Which, uh, it all depends on on, on how the pasture uh, uh, looks. Another another way to use forages is through uh, rotational stocking. Um, 
Now, uh, just just to give you an idea, if we use uh, a medium stocking rate, we continue it continuously stock. Let's assume that that's that's um, that's the relative stocking rate that we can have. However, if we use rotationally uh, rotational stocking, uh, we can think about increasing the stocking rate a little bit. Uh, we are saying that probably 25 to 30 percent more uh, more stocking rate is, is possible if we use uh, rotationally rotational stocking or rotational grazing, as commonly known. To do that, we need to have, or we need to probably be on, on top of it a lot more from the standpoint of, the, of, of making the decision about when we start grazing and when we need to take animals out of the pasture and how many days of rest those pastures uh, need to have. Uh, these again are guidelines, are, are, are kind of rule of thumb type of deal. So again, uh, going down here for annual ryegrass, um, you need to wait uh, to start grazing those pastures until they are somewhere between six inches of height to 12. If you're using rotational stocking, um, the more convenient um, reference is you need to move them when the, those, those, uh, that height is uh, between three, uh, three to four inches. And in animal ryegrass, depending on the on the stage of growth that the that the pasture is, that means that you need to wait between seven to fifteen days to go back to that same pasture that you take the animals from. Uh, so again, rotational the rotational stocking may allow you to use a, a, a greater uh, stocking rate, but you may, you need to be more on top of the management in terms of uh, when you need to start grazing, when you need to take out animals from the pasture and days of rest that those pastures need. This implies that you need to plan ahead of time as to how many uh, paddocks you're going to be using in, in your rotational uh, grazing system. Rotational stocking is also, uh, is, is all, can be also a good management practice for diet selection. And what it means is by doing, by doing rotational stocking, you're actually allow the animal to harvest the top, the top uh, leaves of the, of the plant, grasses or, or legumes. Uh, by doing that, they actually are consuming the highest quality, um, low fiber type of type of forage. Uh, you know, if if you let them stay in your pastures for longer than what is needed, they they will get back to that those pastures that he, that they graze originally, and the second bite will may maybe be a medium quality. And if they graze down to the ground, uh, or I should say, uh, the bottom uh, few inches of of the plant. Um, they are going to get that bite is going to be the lowest quality just because it's high in fiber um, and, and may affect actually, by the way, uh, regrowth of the, of the plant. So the way you graze those, those plants evidently have an impact, of course, in how much nutrients, how many nutrients those animals are harvesting. Another effect that, uh, that have the, the rotational stocking is actually allow the plants um, to, to, um, to develop roots as, as needed. Uh, there is an old, um, uh, an old saying too, uh, or, a, or an old uh, rule of thumb that says take half and leave half. Uh, one, of the, one of the main reasons why that, that is said is the impact that, um, that the leaf volume removed has on, uh, on the development of, uh, of roots. And as you can see in this uh, table, uh, once you go up to 50% of the leaf volume removed, you're actually affecting roots very little. But once you go past those, that 50%, uh, the growth of those roots are, are negatively impacted. And of course, the closest to the ground you graze that plant, uh, the most negative the impact is going to be on root development. Another, uh, another issue with uh, or, or a good side of, uh, of rotational grazing is that you don't let the animal graze down too much on the, on, on the individual plants. And the other, the, the reason related to this also is the presence of infective larvae in the lowest portions of the plant. Um, it is known that, that uh, uh, worm, worms are not present, or larvae of worms are not present, present uh, at 15 centimeters, which is, um, which is basically six, uh, six inches, approximately six, seven inches of, of height. Um, there is very low at 10 centimeters, which will be around four, four inches of, of height. But you're going to have a lot of uh, worms and the highest percent of worms present um, at an inch to two inches of height of the plant. So 
What I'm saying with this is that, and that's another reason why not to graze below two to three inches, is that you're leaving on the pasture the parts of the plant where more than probably are full of larvae. Uh, again, you can have clean pastures, that's a different story, but um, the, but the presence of, uh, of, of, of larvae in, uh, in, in pastures are related directly to uh, the height um, of, of the plant from the ground level. So uh, again, uh, two or three inches um, of, uh, of height of that plant from the ground is where the maximum concentration of larvae are present. Uh, some of you may use uh, may use mixed pastures, so not only just with annual ryegrass or other grasses, but also but also clovers. And one thing that we we know is that if we graze uh, the the mixed pasture too low, let's say one one and a half, this is one and a half inches, and this is three inches. As you can see in the in the drawing, by grazing at one and a half inch, we we allow the white clover to actually develop even more compared with uh, with grasses. And the reason for that is that the regrowth of the clover is a lot more quicker um, when and they are able because basically they are able able to uh, intercept a lot more uh, sunlight because of the the architecture of the plant, the type of uh, leaves that they have and how they are. Uh, post towards uh, towards the sun. On the other side, if we graze um, those mixed pastures uh, at three inches uh, as, as a maximum, three inches from the ground, uh, that allow the grass to actually compete more for light with the clover. Uh, in this particular case on the left, you may have in the, in, you know, as grazing season advance, um, a lot more clover than what you actually desire or what you actually need. It's much better to keep a three-inch kind of a three-inch kind of stubble, so that you let the grass uh, grow as needed. As I mentioned before, planting method method can be an, can have an effect on uh, on how much grass is produced, and when actually you can start uh, grazing your pastures. I put together a, a, old, a lot of data that that I had through the years. Uh, this is not counting year effect, so again, take this uh, with a grain of salt, but just to give you an idea uh, of, uh, of the number of days that you need to wait depending on the planting method that, that you use. Uh, on average, uh, when we broadcast on Bermuda grass uh, stand and then we, we disc as a, as a way to allow the, or help the seed get in contact with the, with the soil, with the ground or the soil, uh, we needed to wait 171 days on average um, to get uh, to put uh, animals on those pasture. Sod seeding uh, with a no-till, sod seeding on Bermuda grass no-till plus herbicide um, let us start grazing earlier than, uh, than broadcast, um, a few 20 days or so uh, when it was just no-till and, and, and probably 50 days before uh, when we use herbicide to kind of stop of that Bermuda grass for, from from growing in the in the fall. When we no till on clean pastures, uh, we needed to wait on average 92 days, or when we did conventional planting of um, of uh, these uh, winter pastures, uh, we just needed to wait at 65. My point with all this is, if you move from the top of that table to below, we have a, quite a difference between the the number of days that we, from planting to the start of, of grazing, um, depending on the planting method. Again, and I'm saying it again, uh, this is not counting ear effects and everything. It's just raw data that I wanted to, to show you. Um, this is actually an experiment that I ran for, for um, three years uh, using conventional planting, no-till and, uh, and broadcast. And as you can see, uh, the forage production was greater for conventional and lower for broadcast. And actually, that's the only difference that we 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 got. Um, on average, there was around 1,700 pounds uh, kilograms of dry matter per hectare versus 270, uh, 2,700. I'm sorry for conventional. No till was in the middle and was no different from from either of the conventional or broadcast. Now, in terms of uh, average daily gains, uh, grazing days and beef uh, production per acre. Uh, that's uh, that's the table indicated there. As you can see, with a no-till, we were able to graze the longer, and we produce more beef uh, per acre. 
Now, the reasons why conventional has less days than no-till is, is that we took the animals out of the pasture uh, if there was too much rain uh, in order for that, um, that, uh, that you know, sword not to be deteriorated because of the rain. These animals, uh, in this particular uh, experiment, they were uh, continuously stalked on the, on the pasture. So uh, that's the reason why actually grazing days is, is lower for conventional compared with uh, no-till. In the case of broadcast, we just needed to wait uh, long enough uh, to actually uh, start, start grazing and have enough gra gra grass and enough uh, height for all that grass to, to start the, the grazing season. So again, in that case, in this particular case, the no-till uh, worked better um, than the other two. This was a demonstration that uh, Limus and Pivot did uh, last year, and, uh, and I think it also shows uh, the impact of, uh, of planting method on what you can do um, or what you need to wait for to start grazing. Uh, on the picture uh, on the left is Bermuda grass sod, uh, sod seeding, 30 pounds of rye grass per acre. Um, and the one in the right is prepared seed bed, 25 pounds to the acre. On this one, on the prepared seed bed, the grazing started on June 15, and the one on Bermuda grass sod is started on March the 3rd. So there was, a, according to them, 47 days grazing loss with an estimated average daily gain lost of two and a half pounds per day, which means 118 pounds of gain per animal with a loss of revenue of 106. And depending on the numbers that you may get, this, of course, these, these results may vary. But the, the point that, uh, that I, I, I think is, uh, is clear is that uh, depending on how you prepare uh, the ground for those pastures to be grazed will affect how early you can get on, on those pastures. Another important, uh, another important management uh, practice when you're overseeding uh, pastures that are, for example, Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, or a combination of them, is residue management, meaning how much dry matter from Bermuda or Bahia or, the, or any of the, uh, or the grasses, summer grasses are present when you plant uh, those pastures. And this is, um, this is something that, uh, that uh, also was conducted, a uh, demonstration that was conducted in Mississippi, and it shows uh, arrow leaf a clover that was planted on, on Bahia grass with a residue of uh, six inches tall. And this on the right is the uh, arrow leaf again on Bahia grass, but with a residue of just uh, one inch. And those pictures, these pictures were taken in April 15, both of them. As you can see, uh, the excess Bahia grass residue um, on, on the left shaded uh, the, the seedlings uh, that of the arrow leaf uh, when it was growing and affected uh, not only growth, but also evidently establishment of that arrow leaf. On the right, on the other hand, we have 12 inches of height of uh, arrow leaf uh, when it was planted with just uh, one inch uh, residue. It may also be important for you to consider the termination of uh, winter pastures, meaning when, when are you going to uh, stop using those winter pastures, thinking of the summer perennial that is below that, that winter pasture. And this is, this is also uh, critically important from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, your grazing systems and the, and the year round uh, grazing plan that you have. And this again is a, a picture that uh, Limus and, and PV published um, last, uh, last year on the, on the uh, left, on the left, uh, that's uh, Bahia grass. And it was not, uh, annual rye grass was not planted uh, in the previous fall, on this, on the left, you have uh, uh, the same Bahia grass stand that was uh, that received a drill annual rye grass in the fall, and these pictures was taken were taken in May 7, uh, 2020. As you can see, there is a lot more grass Bahia grass developed on the left compared with the right. Here you can see the the, the annual rye grass uh, drill line. Uh, so when you actually stop using the winter pastures and, and it is critical too. Um, we need to think that we want uh, as best if you're doing if you're using uh, uh, summer perennials, uh, you need to think that we you need them to uh, start growing um, as, as early as possible and you don't want to affect uh, early growth because you can actually uh, affect the, the general uh, forest production for that summer. 
So final thoughts and concluding the, the presentation. Don't be in a hurry to start grazing. Don't look at your calendar to decide um, when you need to start grazing. Look at your pastures. That will be the best indication or the best advice that I can give you. Start grazing when there is, when, when, uh, there is an appropriate uh, height of, the, of that grass. Grazing too early, I think, is shown that reduces forage, forage production. You affect, um, you affect how much they, the, gra the grass actually can grow. Uh, we have a lot of factors affecting, uh, affecting forage production, but weather and planting method evidently are, uh, are two, two big ones. In terms of the decisions that you need to take uh, when you think about stocking rate, again, probably from the standpoint of management, the, the, the most important one, Think about pounds of body weight per acre that you're actually using. Uh, decide, in, decide in terms of what you prefer to use of a set stocking rate or variable. It's up to how you manage the whole farm in terms of how the, these decisions can be made. It all depends on uh, your own set of resources that, uh, that you can actually make decisions like this. Uh, continuous versus rotationally stocking. Um, it influences that and think about the, the use of early grazing um, also as a, as a management uh, practice. Uh, we didn't talk much about um, uh, small grains like oats and rye, for example, but they grow, during the fall, they grow a lot faster than, than what ryegrass does. So they will be, if you plant at the same, on the same day, oats or, or rye versus ryegrass, oats and rye are going to be available for grazing earlier. So it might not be a bad idea to have pastures with uh, oats, rye, um, just them or oats, fried and, and ryegrass, uh, so that you have um, so that you have grazing earlier than your pure stands. Once you are done with the with the small grains, you can move forward into the pure stand of ryegrass, where that should be available at that point in time. Avoid overgrazing, and that that's also critical. Stop grazing at, at an appropriate height. Uh, shorter than two or three inches. I think there are too many reasons why why to stop before. Uh, that height and uh, cold weather is one of them uh, because it can affect um, the stand and slow regrowth. And the other point is also at the end of the grazing season, when do you need to end grazing the winter animals? Um, if you are planting on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a warm season perennial sod, you need to think that they may start grazing uh, in April. Uh, I'm sorry, not grazing, uh, growing in April. Uh, uh, any any competition for for uh, for sunlight or or moisture uh, can affect the way they grow. So um, of course keep that in mind. And I will start um, and I will finish the the final thoughts the way I started. Do not hurry up and forget the calendar. With that, um, thank you so much for your attention. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to take over the screen real quick. Again, if y'all have questions, you can text them to me, 512-818-5476, uh, or you can put those into the Q&A box. I am hopefully going to do this correctly. Okay, um, if y'all don't mind, please providing some feedback on our um, webinar today with Dr. Scaglia. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. So if you're on right now, you can open well, let me back up. If you're on right now or if you're watching the recording of this, you can open the camera on your phone, view the little QR code. You'll get a notification banner at the top. Click on that and you can go immediately to the survey. This is also where you can um, give some kind of feedback on what you would like to see from us moving forward into the series as well. Any topics that you would like for us to cover in the future. And then you can always find um, the recordings of these on our website, which is lsuagcenter.com forward slash beef brunch or on our YouTube channel, LSU Ag Center dash livestock. And we do these as videos. We also have podcast formats as well. Uh, if you prefer to listen to them while you're while you're driving down the road, uh, we also do a biweekly news update. So every other week we do a short about 20 to 30 minute news update and all of those are on those websites as well. Dr. Scaglia, I don't see any questions for you today. I want to thank you again um, for your time and for being with us. And uh, Dr. Scaglia and I will both be back with y'all in November um, to discuss some bull management. So um, the link for that and all that information, as well as our upcoming webinars and news updates are all on the lsuagcenter.com forward slash beef brunch website. So we will be back with y'all next month.